Are we confined to scripture when arguing for the faith? Hi, my name is Ted Rosenblatt. I'm here with my father, Dr. Rod Rosenblatt, and this is Talks with Dad Rod. This is Epiphany. This is the season of Epiphany uh, for us Lutherans. And I know some you know, denominations don't go by a formal uh, church year, church calendar, any of that stuff. But Epiphany is, is when uh, we are finished with the Christmas season. This, is a, this directly follows the Christmas season. And, and Dad, you've always called it the, what is that? What do you like to call that? The Apologist Sunday. And why is that? The text that refers to it based on uh, usually is Jesus at Cana doing his first public miracle. So it's Epiphany being that he's proving his, his godhood. Not just man, but also God. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the focus uh, when we're talking about, it lets us kind of dip into our, our uh, um, apologetic focus uh, that we return to on the regular. And there's a number, we, we were discussing a number of different things here. The official text for uh, the church year for us this year is... Um, Matthew 2, 1 to 8, and I'm going to read that real fast. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the, from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For, uh, for from you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I, may, I too may come and worship him. Now, uh, something we had, as we were kind of going through our, our show prep, Rick Ritchie did a, a little bit of uh, commentary about this as, uh, as we were discussing it. Herod's men searched the scriptures, and Herod wanted to kill Jesus. The wise men follow the star, which, so far as we know, was not mentioned before in the scriptures. And this taps into the idea that, that Herod, using the scriptures, was trying to use the scriptures to determine where Jesus was so he could get to him and kill him. And these men who were not of that faith and were completely outside their culture used something in the sky to determine the, the truth of the matter and the location and, and, and where to go. But Luther had a comment about that idea. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a, a vinyl record where Roland Mainton of Yale sort of compressed all of Luther's Christmas sermons into one. I recorded that, but they've got the copyright, so I can't share it. <clears throat> but it used to be on a vinyl record. And in there, Luther, he quotes Luther as saying, now let nobody here start to indulge in astrology. This is not an open door for you to do that. <laughs> that was just a throwaway line for him. Yeah, this isn't to say that the uh, the scriptures are valueless or something in determining this, and somehow the stars are where we should be spending our time. And overall, as we, you and I talked about before the show, the true God is free to reveal himself any way he wants to. He is completely free to do that. We are not free to invent new ways to find him or label new revelations, or any of that sort of magic eight ball stuff. He is free to reveal himself as he so chooses. And something else, something else that is in play for us sinners is that we're always on that note trying to come up with something more enjoyable to play with than, than some, some yep. basic, super basic. Yep. Um, maybe even boringly so, 
uh, evidences that we would typically use. So I've learned it from you. Usually the measure about whether something should be considered is done from the point of perspective of, of a courtroom. Sure. When the apologists who do that sort of thing are called evidentialists. And uh, the classic is, as I've recommended so many times, Dr. Montgomery's audio intro to apologetics. We sell it at 1517, the audio, um, Sensible Christianity. He gave this in city after city after city throughout the U.S., and it was designed for the laity. If the clergy wanted to come for it, fine. But it was designed for the laity as an intro to this field, the defense of the faith. And Dr. Montgomery's an evidentialist. And this is, this is our opportunity. It's the one opportunity guaranteed out of the year where we get to play with that a little bit. In our, in, in our, our own here. church, our own pastors don't know what Epiphany Sunday is. Why? Because we don't have courses in apologetics anymore. And that's what we're trying to do here is, is at least give you a sense of right. the value of it. And one of those things is how do we as human beings make judgments on what is true and not true all the time on any given day? Any given intro to philosophy is going to have some chapter, chapter seven or eight, how do we know anything? How do we know? And that chapter is the sort of thing it'd be worth taking a look at. What have been the options in the West as to how do I know X? And they go through them all. It's funny. I mean, we're in a culture now that is buried in the internet. We have the internet, electronics. We have this, do, we do this electronically now. Historically, it seems like as soon as somebody has written a book on a subject, somehow just by its format or something, it's, it's, it's cons worth considering. Mm -hmm. But our whole generation seems to have come down this path that everything, we, we, we make our subjective determinations internally on everything as though we are little mini gods and and we are very dismissive of what anybody may say they may have experienced to our detriment to our to our detriment and right. you and I were talking about this how can we know any human history when there was no video there was no audio recording there was no internet there was men writing on parchments what happened that became books yep Things that were written versions of what men would share with each other by voice. Imagine men from tri different tribes speaking to one another about what they'd witnessed and what had happened. Yep. What, what other evidence is there? Yep. You couldn't do photos. Yep. You couldn't do videos. You couldn't do audio recording. You couldn't do anything. There was none of that. How could you trust anything? Yep. And in our generation, as you've said... Uh, we've got a sort of a nihilism of knowing going on throughout the Western culture. How could you know anything? It's like a rot. It's like, we, yeah. it's like we're going against thought right. right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, my intro to Phil that I would go to first is by the late John Hospers, H-O-S-P-E-R-S. -E but there's a slew of them. Some good, some not so good, but... The chapter on how do we know? Well, I, so, so think about it at a basic level. Think about if there were witnesses to a crime that, that affected you and you had to go before a jury and there, was, there wasn't conclusive evidence about one thing happening or another, what, what does a jury use to make their judgment? And it's accepted in court. Mm -hmm. It's eyewitness accounts mm -hmm. are one of the top things. If somebody, and especially if there's more than one person, person witnessed the same event, even if they, they seem to have slightly differentiating facts or, or details, they're generally saying the same thing from different perspectives. Yep. Those are acceptable. And, and, and the, the more, jury is told to follow the evidence. But that's the evidence that they're given is somebody's yep. memory of, what's, of the, what they personally witnessed. Yep. And, and the more of those voices witnessed it, the, the stronger it gets. Yep. But we make those judgments all the time. I and mean, men are put in prison with evidence like this or yep. not or yep or or are set free. Yep. That's what uh, that's what John Montgomery was teaching. 
yep. has taught for so long is yep. why does that matter? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? So he, uh, why is it so important that we look at the, the statements made in Scripture through that lens? Right. Um, because it's objective, not subjective. But wouldn't people in this culture say that somebody speaking about an, uh, an event is subjective by its very nature? Anybody can say anything, Dad. That's a commentary on where we are. Not where we should be, but where we unfortunately are. Nobody believes anything from anybody. Even with video. Yeah. Oh, that's Photoshopped. Yep. Oh, that's AI. Yep. Yep. So we have to just realize we're in an anti-intellectual culture, one that's highly prone to anything, particularly emotional, and recognize what is it to try and find what's true when I'm living in a culture like that? In general, the early Christians argued that Jesus was the promised Jewish Christ from Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by Jesus in his life. What about the whole world of Goy, that is, non-Jews, guys like us? Um, well, the earliest Christians, in talking to Gentiles, argued more philosophically because we didn't have an Old Testament. They couldn't refer to it. We didn't have that. So they tend to go a little bit against Plato or for Plato. It was the history of it all. Isn't that a deeper version of, of the problem of the unknown God? And that was sure. why, that's why Epiphany was so critical? Sure, sure. And the story is, it sort of makes you smile. The wedding ceremony and Jesus' mother comes to him and says, Son, they're out of wine. Help. <laughs> or something equivalent to that. Woman, what does that have to do with me? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that was great. It's not yet my time. Yep. Well, somehow it ended up being his time. I like, yep. that God, I like that God can tweak it a little bit. Oh, fine. Yeah. That's not the time. And, okay, and, fine. And the line from people who were already a little schnoggled, my gosh, usually you serve the swill at the end. This is the good stuff. This is the best. Yeah, this is the really good stuff. Yeah. And credit given to the masters of the house and so forth for that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. But anyway, the reason we should, Lutherans don't, but we should operate from the basic texts of this Epiphany Sunday as apologetics. The first clue as to who he was, objective great wine made out of 30 gallons of water, or how many of her gallons of water? The good stuff. Lots of it. I love it that it was alcohol first. <laughs> I won't get into that discussion. I was about to say something. Right. I'm just going to leave that. We're going to drop that. Right. Um, so, so. We would like to see a return to the teaching of the apologetic task within seminaries mm -hmm. as, as, mm -hmm. a sta as a standard. Mm -hmm. You got to take it. I remember learning from Dr. Montgomery there was a division in the category called systematic theology, and there were three components of the division of that dogmatics, what we call doctrine, ethics, what is the good life, and apologetics, what's true. And, and the Lutherans dumped a third. Dumb. <laughs> I'll leave the judgment to Dad. I won't do it myself. <laughs> All right. So this is, this is what you get. Every time we finish Christmas, you're going to get this kind of a conversation from us. But we believe that apologetics is so important that it's something that we need to be focused on on the regular too. So you'll find things like resurrection fact up here. 
you know, you got to look, go look through our 15, 17 publications, our, our growing library of, of materials, because you will find that we are, we're trying to produce some really best of breed type of material for you so that you can, you can uh, dig in on this a little bit and come away going, okay. And, and understanding this in a way that a lot of Christians don't. So, uh, and why it's valuable so that you find, and you'll find yourself being able to speak more knowledgeably and, and in a way that makes sense. Thus the, the, the term sensible Christianity in a way that makes sense to, um, Christians and non-believers around you. It, it, it matches their experience. That's the great thing about apologetics. It matches how we experience human history on the daily. It, it, it's, it's how we live our lives. So come to 1517.org for more and uh, I hope this has been a very Merry Christmas for you and we're going to get towards you know as we move towards uh, Lent and and Holy Week and all that I'm really looking forward to that this year and I hope you're all doing well Uh, come to 1517.org for more and we'll see you on social media long live the true king Thank you for joining us on Talks with Dad Rod, part of the 1517 Podcast Network. This podcast and all 1517's content is made possible through financial support by listeners just like you. Please visit 1517.org for more, and please consider clicking on the donate button and making a recurring or one-time contribution to help us share this good news in a world which so desperately needs it.